The scripture for today's uh, message comes from James chapter 2, James chapter 1, and 1 John chapter 3. First, reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. This is, uh, most people would believe that James that wrote this was the brother of Jesus, who later was the head of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. What good is it, my brothers, he says, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And James says in James chapter 1, verse 27, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Father God, speak to our hearts, I pray again today, as only you can. I know, Lord, uh, that if uh, any good is going to come from the service today, it'll be because of your work in our lives. And so work in us, I pray, Father, and transform us to be the people you want us to be, to, to hear what you want us to hear, to, to be encouraged, to, to want to know you better, and, and to grow more into the image of your son, Jesus. May we live lives that please and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my hope during this sermon series, which I call the 2020 Vision Series, it's based on our mission statement. My hope is that we will see how it's funded uh, or founded on fundamental beliefs of the Christian church, not just our church, and, and also that we will be able to remember it. So hopefully it'll be something that we can remember. But I'm going to see if anybody can remember just the mission part of it. We want to be a place where what happens? Who can tell me? Ah, non-believers become believers. Thank you so much. What's next then? Believers become? I'm sorry? Okay, that's, that's kind of number three. But that's, yeah, okay, believers become more committed, stronger in their faith. I'll take that, Levi. That's good. And then those who are stronger in their faith, those who are committed Christians become all, Vicky's whispering it to me, no, they become all that God, what? All that God wants us to be. Non-believers become believers. You can put it up now. Non-believers become believers. Believers become more committed in their faith, and those who are committed become all that God wants them to be. And that is, I think, you know, the heart of what uh, the Christian church should be striving for. It is a progression that shows us that we're not meant to stay still. It doesn't end when you become a member. It's just beginning then. And it, we are meant to grow up in Christ, to continue to grow in Christ. We grow in our faith through grace, which is God's undeserved favor for us and God's blessing for us. And we're saved by grace, the Bible tells us, not because of any works that we should do. And so we use grace as an acronym for the things that we respond to God's salvation in, in these five ways. And this is how the church is built, is through our response to God's salvation. We gather for worship, the G in grace, because it's the appropriate response to the lordship and power of God. We reach the lost world through local and global missions because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And before he left, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we are to carry on that work of reaching the lost. Last week, we talked about activities for community building and fellowship, which are the natural result of our relationship with Christ to feel a bond to those who share that same relationship. I just quoted earlier the scripture from Galatians about being part of a family, the, the household of faith, and as being a part of the family of God. And today we're going to talk about compassionate ministries of Christian love before we finish the next week with educating our members for faith and service. So compassionate ministries of Christmas love are our Christian love, not Christmas love, Christian love are mandated by our confession of faith. And you see in, in six 
6.06 in our Confession of Faith. It says, believers are saved by grace through faith, which produces the desire to do good works for which God creates persons in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see that quote from, from Paul later on in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that talks about how we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And then 607 in our, our Confession of Faith says, good works are done in thankful response to the gift of God's grace. God graciously accepts the works of believers despite their many weaknesses and imperfect motives. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say we do good works to try to get God to like us more. Or so God will, we do good works so God will love us. It says that they're a response to God's grace and God's love for us. More importantly, compassionate ministries demonstrate our Christian love, and, and they are demanded in the Scripture. Jesus' brother James wrote, as we just read a moment ago, What good is it if anyone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. And if you read in the book of the Acts about the early church, you'll see that one of the things that they did is they, one of the big, big decisions they had to make was uh, how to take care of all the people who needed help with food and things, uh, especially widows and others, orphans and such. Uh, how are we going to take care of all those needs? And they, they actually eventually said, well, the disciples are spending so much time taking care of feeding the, the, the widows and the orphans that they're not having a chance to really teach and, 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 and do the work of the uh, apostles. So they actually appointed people. Uh, in, in the modern church, we call them deacons now. Uh, but but there is a, that is a purpose that we have, is to take care of the physical needs, too. Our faith should change the way we act. And if we see somebody in need, it should affect us. James says in, in James 27, chapter 1, verse 27, that that's what religion is all about. That pure religion that God loves and respects and is, is faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep themselves from being polluted by the world. William Barclay, when he's talking about this passage, says, no matter how fine your rituals are, you know, you might have the most polished uh, production in church, you know, the pastor might be really on his game, and, and uh, everything, the songs and everything might just all come together just right, the lit liturgy might be great, but he says, the finest rituals you can offer to God, the, the most important thing you can offer to God, he says, is to serve the poor and the, per and the persons who are in need, and keep yourself pure. Those are the two things James says. He goes on to, uh, Barclay goes on to say that real worship doesn't lie in fine clothes or robes that pastors might wear or magnificent music or in caref carefully planned services. Real worship lies in our practical service to people and to the purity of our own personal life. It's perfectly possible, he says, to be a church that's so taken up with the beauty of our building and the splendor of our liturgy that we have neither the time nor the money for the practical Christian service that we are called to. And that's what James is condemning here. And I, when I read William Barclay's comments on that, I thought of a, of a discussion held at a, another church uh, in which, and I know this is going to reveal something to some of you here, but this is what I heard. So hopefully this is a good representation. Uh, this church, it was a small church, and they were instructed by some expert that they needed to put a sign up, a, a, you know, a big sign. And it was going to cost between fifteen and $20,000, I was told. And one of the things that people said when they were discussing this is, what, how many people could we help with that fifteen dollars to $20,000 besides putting up a sign? You know, and that's a good question to ask, by the way. I'm not condemning the sign, I'm just saying that if we, if we don't realize that our real purpose is in our service to one another and our service to God, then we've missed the boat. William Barclay goes on and says, all throughout history, men have struggled to make ritual and liturgy a substitute for sacrifice and service. They've made religion splendid within the church at the, at the expense of neglecting it outside the church. This is by no means to say that it's wrong to seek to have the most noble and most splendid worship service within God's house, but it is to say that all such worship is empty and idle unless it sends a man out to love God 
by loving his fellow man and to walk more purely in the, tempt in the tempting ways of this world. So if it doesn't make a difference out there, uh, we're not doing something right in here. You know, we should, have, we should want to have the best. And I, I cringe whenever I, I know I've messed something up, uh, you know, like when the PowerPoint doesn't work or something. And I, and I, I want things to be top notch. But I also know that, that, you know, everything being good in here is not the ultimate test of whether we're doing what God calls us to do. It's how we impact this world around us. That makes the difference. One of the three disciples that Jesus included in most of his intimate moments of his ministry was John. He was at the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus there. It, he was entrusted with, his, with the care of Jesus' own mother at the cross. He says, behold your mother and son, behold your, uh, son, behold your mother and mother, behold your son. And in other words, John, take care of mama now. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus when he was praying. And John wrote, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, so we should lay down our lives for one another. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, it's, let us love not with just words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So our confession of faith goes on to say in 6.08, good works are the result of and not the means of salvation. And that's something for us to remember. I'm talking about doing all this good stuff here, uh, and how we should do good works and things, but we should not make that the means of our salvation. It's not going to win God's favor. Uh, newsflash, when Jesus died on the cross for you, God was pretty much saying, I love you, period, right then and there. You know, And so you don't have to win his love, but you need to respond to it. It's the result of the salvation you have, that you want to do these things, not to get salvation. And Paul wrote that same thing I mentioned earlier, that passage in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, most famous passage probably begins with verse 8, where it says, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there are good works, but they come after we recognize that it's not anything we do, but it's the grace of God by which we are saved. And then we respond to that by doing what God made us to be and, and made us to do. Compassionate ministries are God's plan, is what we've been saying, and his will for his church. And that's one of the areas that I've always been especially passionate about. It's an area that I feel... Uh, important in every church I've served in. It was, sometimes it's called the Evangelism Committee, uh, sometimes it's called Outreach Committee or whatever, but I've always felt like this is an important part of what churches are supposed to be. And I talked to a pastor friend, and one of the things that she uh, had shared with me was that they had had a huge building debt, and so the church had been kind of inwardly focused for a long time, and her goal was to get them thinking outside the doors of the church again, to get them thinking about what we need to be doing uh, to impact the world for Christ. And, and here's some of the things that we do as Compassionate Ministries of Christian Love. In our 2019 donations, uh, we gave over $2,000 to the Buddy Pack program. And in addition to that $2,000, we had individuals giving gifts, and we have uh, women's ministry giving gifts and, and such. And we have one of our members was inspired, as you saw in the newspaper maybe recently, Mark Clemens, to raffle off a, a racing helmet he would design, and he raised over $3,000. So over $5,000, probably $6,000 from our church uh, to the Buddy Pack program to provide food for kids. The Military Bible Stick program is something we do every May, and last year's offering was $1,220 to provide Bibles for our servicemen and women. Our Loaves and Fishes offering combat, combats hunger, and we raised $465 right before Christmas. And then we gave $300 for food to the Community Holiday Project. We gave $200 to Great Circle for the children to have Christmas there. We, we have a coat rack that we've given away dozens of coats for people who need them. That was inspired by some of our young people, by the way, I might add. We have Operation Christmas Child Boxes, where we send Christmas presents in the gospel to, to, well, this year to 60 different kids. We serve meals to 100 Missouri Valley College students during spring break when the campus cafeteria is closed down. By the way, we're going to be doing it again in March, and we might be asking for help. Uh, our, our volunteers have done it for two years, have moved, so we need some help. 
but that's something we wanted to do. And we give $13,000 to our United Outreach offering every year that we don't even think about. That is extra. But most, one of the most important outreaches we do in my book uh, is not supported by our regular offerings at all. And it's something that's not in our budget at all, but it's totally extra giving. And our extra giving for the Samaritan Fund, which helps with utilities, keeping utilities on, provides food through our food pantry, and so forth. Um, in 2019, we helped 350 times in a total of $33,610. We have a church with a budget of $120,000, $115,000, and we gave an extra, like a third of our budget, for this outreach. So, um, okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm getting sounding boastful now. <laughs> but, I, but that is something that's, on, that's always on my heart. And I've been so blessed to be able to be a part of that. And I know Diane Hackler, who sits with me with the folks who come in each week, you know, sometimes we see lots of tears, don't we? And we see some, grat we see some shock. You're really going to help me. And, um, and it's such a blessing. And that doesn't, all that's giving does not include the fact that men's fellowship and women's ministries are doing things too. The women's groups support the Buddy Back program also. They organize bereavement dinners for families who've lost loved ones. They provide meals for the Hoot House Resource Center. They donate to the Stott Wallace Missionary Fund to keep missionaries in the field. They sponsor a cottage at our CP Children's Home in Denton, Texas. They give an extra $100 donation every year at Father's Day for that. Uh, they support the American Bible Society, the Meals on Wheels program here in town, hot lunch program in Guatemala, and other second mile giving. And they send, you know, my mom always said she got more cards from our church than she did from her church. They send get well cards and sympathy cards and thinking of you cards and congratulations cards to members of our family. They, they reach out. Men's Fellowship, like I said earlier, is preparing a, a hog supper for the Browning family as they continue to fight cancer, and we're going to do that in March. And the Men's Fellowship has provided meals for the MHS football team for the last few years as well to kick off their season. And then we have the prayer shawl ministry, and we show our love to families going through loss and health problems and transitions and new beginnings. And Steve Graves leads the Meals on Wheels I mentioned earlier. He, he gets those volunteers together every month to take food to people who are hungry in our community. And at the beginning of every month, we serve a meal to our, our well service on Tuesday nights. So what I'm saying is we put our feet on our faith. We put feet on our faith here at Cumberland, and love is a verb here. It's, it's active, and that's the way it should be. So if I'm giving us a grade card, you know, across the board on, on, the, on our five things that we do, you know, I, I think we get pretty good marks here on this area, but there's room for improvement. You know, I look back five years ago when we started this mission statement, and there's some things that we were doing that we're not doing anymore. So uh, I, I know that we are not doing all that we could, but I'm so blessed to, to be a part of the outreach that you are doing. Uh, and part of that outreach, by the way, is sometimes in the form of, of uh, providing movies for people who can't afford them, one of which is tonight, by the way in our basement, so come, come and join us, even if you could afford it. William Barclay says, fine words will never take the place of fine deeds, and no amount of talk of Christian love will take the place of a kindly action to someone in need, involving some self-sacrifice, for in that action, the principle of the cross is operative again. In other words, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He saw our need, and he made the sacrifice to meet it. I agree with William Barclay when he says, when you see your brother in need and have enough to give him of what you have to follow Christ, to give him of what you have is to follow Christ if you help someone. To shut your heart to them is to show that you don't have the love of Christ in you. N.T. Wright says, it won't do simply to tick the box saying, I believe in God and hope that will do. It won't. He says, without a radical change of life, that faith is worthless and will not rescue someone from sin and death. Translating belief into action, even when it seems impossible or downright dangerous, that's the faith that matters. That's the faith that justifies, and that's the, that's the faith that saves. Make sure your faith is the real thing, that it does what it says on the packet.
compassionate ministries of Christian loves, of love are the ways that we show that we love God and that our faith is genuine and that Jesus lives in us. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. So love has to be the heart of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because giving all you have to the Samaritan Fund or to the Buddy Pack program or Military Bible Stick program, all those things mean nothing if there's not love behind it. No church lives long or deserves to that fails to live out their love in the way they live. When I was in, in uh, youth group at Smith Chapel growing up, one of the girls one day said at our youth group meeting, and this is, I think, a quote from a, actually an opening from a musical, a song in a musical, the love in your heart wasn't put there to stay because love isn't love until you give it away. And so I encourage you today to give it away. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us to, to uh, realize that when we give a drink of water to someone who is thirsty, your word says that we're doing it to you or for you. When we give food to someone in, who's hungry, that we are feeding you. When we give clothing to those who need clothes or when we visit someone in prison, when we do all these things you said, to the least of these are brothers, we do them, do them for you. Whatever we do in word and deed, Lord, may we do for you. May we give it away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.